Now I think there's a spider above me. We talked about that in class, didn't we, teenagers? <laughs> I don't know why we talked about spiders, but we did. Galatians chapter 4. Um, yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> the game of fun packs is over. Now I'm, I'm going to move this pulpit somewhere else. <laughs> Galatians chapter number four, we, be, uh, we continue on in the study of Galatians and we've been going chapter by chapter tonight. We're not going to do the whole chapter because, well, there's just too much in this chapter. I tried, I tried, I, I could not go and do one whole chapter. It's impossible. You cannot skip over so much good stuff. That'd be like going to a restaurant and order a big fat T-bone and just eating around the edges and leaving all that meat on your plate. You just can't do it. You've got to stop and enjoy every mouth-watering savor. Anybody hungry yet? I haven't had dinner yet, so I'm getting hungry talking about it. Galatians chapter 4, I hope you found your place there. Uh, believe it or not, I'll be somewhat short because I'm breaking it in half. Um, I only say that because somebody made a post on Facebook and said when the preacher says that, they're, it's, uh, they had like a fact checker on there, you know, Facebook fact checkers, false information when the preacher says it won't be long. Galatians chapter 4, verse number 1, the Bible says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under the tutors and the governors unto the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of this world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because your sons, God hath sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then a heir of God through, Jesus, uh, through Christ. Howbeit then, when ye know not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods, but now, after that ye have known God, or rather that known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desired again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you the labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, for as I am, or as I am as ye are, ye have not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation, which was in the flesh, you despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is this uh, then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth, our Father, we come to you this evening now at this time, this appointed time of preaching. And God, I pray that you would help me to be able to uh, say all that needs to be said tonight and say only that which you'd have me to say. I pray, Lord God, that you'd give me an unction from on high, give me a power to preach. And Father, I pray that your word would go forth and do as you've said it would in the people. And God, I pray that you would be honored, glorified, and have preeminence in everything said and done in the rest of this service. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the first uh, couple verses here, we'll find, and we're going to jump right in. I only have uh, five points tonight uh, as we dissect really the first 12. I read the first uh, 15, 16 verses, I believe it was, uh, to give us the full context of what's going on in this particular portion of Scripture. But in the first two verses, we're given something that's kind of odd, that kind of stands out. It says, Now I say that the hair, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant. You know, sometimes Christians, uh, people who get saved, they suddenly get this idea, almost as though they got a chip on their shoulder, they become something above everybody else. And quite frankly, the truth of the matter is we actually become humbled before the world and now are the servants of Jesus Christ to humbly take the gospel to them just as he did. The Bible said, Jesus speaking, said, uh, no greater love hath a man than this, that he laid down his life for a friend, and that word to me means to lay prostrate, to lay out 
as though you would lay across the ground so that somebody could step upon you to, uh, to get somewhere safe. I used the illustration one time preaching a message from that passage of somebody laying in a, in a puddle of mud and allowing somebody to walk over so they would not get their feet dirty. That's the idea of what Jesus is speaking of, that a man lay down his lo- life for a friend. It's that you would take the humility the uh, being a humble and allowing people to walk over you so that they could see Christ. It means that you're going to have to get down from where you want to be. In this passage of Scripture, it ends that verse with this thought. Though he be Lord of all. So it says that he's a child, he's a heir, but he's a child and a servant. There is no difference between the two. And he says, though he be Lord of all, though he's about to inherit uh, some great magnificent inheritance, he is still a servant. And boy, what a powerful statement, how we could summarize all that Christianity is just in this one verse. A child that is heir to the uh, kingdom that is to come. I want you to notice, first of all, number one, the process of progress. The process of progress. Process means moving towards something. Progress means growth. I don't think those doors are going to stop because that door is open out there. Uh, you might end up having to close it. Go ahead and close it, brother. Is everybody okay? If, you want, if you'll stay awake, I won't run across the top of the pews. But if you go to sleep, I'm just going to go across the top of them pews. Yeah, you want to say? <laughs> I'll save it for Monday's or Sunday's message. I got a good one for Sunday. Lord gave me something wonderful. I can't wait to preach that message. We can just have the service all night. And I can preach it tonight. Amen. The process of progress, moving towards something, is the uh, the the definition of process. Progress means growth. That's what's going on here. When he says he's a hare, but he's a child, a servant. Next verse number two is what's going to define verse number one. Look at verse number two. It says, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. He's saying, here's this child who's just inherited this mass fortune. The illustration is you have this incredible um, fortune, that's an estate, if you will, that's been given to you. And this estate is now um, given to this child, and he, he, boy, he's rich. He's got, let's say he's got a billion dollars. He's got all that. But typically, an estate has some parameters to it. So if a young boy were to inherit a billion dollars, they might say that he can't have any money until he's at least 18 years old, or he's at least 21 years old. Or it may even be a parameter where they would break it down and they'd say, after 10 years he gets so much money, after 20 years he gets so much money. That's what's being dealt here. He's saying this child, though he's inherited something, he's appointed tutors and governors over his life. There's a process of growth that takes place. Governors, I um, mean, and I didn't put this stuff in my notes, but I suppose if you were to really think about this, tutors are teachers. He can't take on that wealth, that inheritance, until he's been taught something. He's going to have to know how to handle a billion dollars. Yeah, you know, the issue that we have in today's time is a great debt. Everybody's going deeper and deeper and deeper in debt. Why? Because not too long ago, they quit teaching finances in high school. I mean, the, the in-depth, you know, keeping track of the, the uh, uh, checkbooks, uh, what do they call that thing? Ledger. They quit teaching ledger uh, work. That Nobody knows how to do that anymore. And ironically, children are going deeper and deeper in debt. That's the picture of a tutor. He's to be taught something before that inheritance can become his. There has to be some identified growth, some uh, estates leave in their will that in order for you to inherit that par- portion of the estate, you must reach a certain level of education. You must get a master's degree. You must become a doctorate. You must get your PhD. There has to be a certain level of education acquired in order to receive your inheritance. Now, if you go online and search out some of the things that are required, it would really blow your mind. And some of these people, you know, oftentimes, it's, it's, in matter of fact, quite often in the news, they, they talk about how bad rich people are. And, yes, there's some ideas. That, yeah, they do some wicked things with their money. But the truth of the matter is, if you look what they go through to take on that family name, the education that they must accomplish to take on that family, it, it's more than we'd be willing to do, I think, for some of that money. So you have the tutors. Then it says the governors. 
Now, I like that the King James Bible has that word governors there because he's talking about the inheritance to come. But that word governors is one who literally governs the child. It's one that says you cannot do this or you can do this and you can do this at this appointed time. He sets the parameters and that child must act within those parameters until the Bible says the father says that he can. There's a process of progress. The inheritance is there. It's his. But he's going to have to go through the proper process to get to the place where he can receive it. I see the illustration here of the Christian. If you've ever, if you just have sat down and, and watched people grow in Christianity, some of you who've been in this church for a long time, you've undoubtedly seen people come in and go out and come in and go out. You've seen people in, along the way, you've seen the process of their growth. You've seen them when they started off a new Christian and they'd say and do things. You're like, uh, Christians shouldn't say and do that. But over time, you watch them and sometimes you sit back and think, man, I wish I was as godly as that character is. What is that? That is the process. Now, everybody's a different process. Some people give in easily, and they, they're, they're just, whatever I'm told to do, I'm going to do it just that way. Others are rebellious. I'm not going to do it that way. And after they get hit upside the head 10, 20 times, they finally give in and do it the way that they should have done it to begin with. I'm that guy. But they all have a process. That's why the, the father in this illustration, verse 1 and 2, that father puts that governor, put parameters around them. And our walk with Christ is the same thing. Remember what we're talking about. We're studying the book of Galatians. We're in chapter 4. For, uh, chapter 3, the very beginning of chapter 3, what does he say? Oh, foolish Galatians. These are the hard-headed people that just didn't get it. How easy it is. You just have to do what God tells you to do, and all these things will be added unto you. But they're foolish. They just keep fighting against them. And we're going to break all this down and see all this. But in this, this first verse, he says, You're a hare, you're a child, but you're a servant. You have got to show that you're capable of taking on those responsibilities. Some people get saved. And the very first thing they do, and it's good intentions. I was this way. As soon as I got saved, boy, I was ready to go 100 mile an hour in the ministry. I'm ready to serve God. I mean, I started preaching a month later, a couple weeks later, I think it was. I was already preaching in nursing homes and got to preaching immediately. But there was this process that needed to take place. And it caused me to trip and fall so many times and hit my head and keep, I'd get back up and get going again. Next thing I know, I hit my head and fall again and get back up. It was a process continued growing. But now looking back, I see all the lessons I've learned so that God could give me some uh, responsibilities to serve him now. A little piece of the inheritance. That's what he's addressing here. And it's important for you to get that. And that's why I'm spending this time of this two verses because this is a picture of Christianity. These two verses, the Lord of all, it says. How oftentimes we've heard, when you're saved, you're under grace. You now have liberty. It says, don't use that grace as a cloak of sin. God forbid that you use it for as a means to sin. Because, let's face it, you're going to, save, uh, to heaven because you're saved. You can't lose your salvation. I mean, technically you could sin. He said, God forbid. You have all that. Though you're Lord of all, you need to grow. And there needs to be a, a process of growth taking place. The reason he says, but is under, verse 2, is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father is because the father looks at the person. He knows his child. I know my five children that we currently have. And there's some, there's one in particular who's smarter than the rest of his brothers. I will give, give him more freedoms even though he's not the oldest. Matter of fact, he's uh, uh, down the chain. He, he knows what I expect of him and he's not going to cross the line. But two of the older ones, I know for a fact that at the minute I turn away, they're going to cross the line. And so I have put other parameters around them that they can never be alone for more than 10 seconds. That's what's being spoken of here. God has put some parameters in your life. And I'm afraid that some people like these Galatians. Paul's addressing the Galatians. Remember this. He's talking to the churches in Galatia. He's saying, listen to me. God's put some parameters. You're over here looking at that church over there, and God's doing all this over there, and you want that so bad for your church. He says, but listen, your guidelines are a little bit different because you're hard-headed. 
And then you're looking over here and you're saying, ah, look at us, we're better than that church over there. We're better than that Christian over there. And he said, the reason is, is because, you see, they, they've got some more liberty, or they're struggling more, so God's put more parameters around them. So where this one's ahead of you and this one's behind you, he said, don't get caught up on this. We're all Christians. We're all children with, uh, of uh, joint hairs with Christ, the Bible says. And he's saying there's a growth process that needs to be taking place. And he says, oh foolish Galatians, you're so caught up in looking at all the things around you that your, your eyes are not where they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be on Christ. They're supposed to be on what God will do for you and grow you and use you as a tool. And as you come out of verse 2, you'll see what I'm talking about. Even so, we, in verse 3, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. You're playing a game of Christianity. You're, you're going outside the parameters that the governors of, uh, around you, those things that have been set around you, those governors, by the way, the governors uh, in this life would be the, the teacher, the tutors would be your church. The governors would be the, the pastor of the word of God. That's what governs your life, right? The pastor preaches the word. The point of a pastor is a shepherd, under shepherd. He's the shepherd. He's to come along and he, you got to go this way. He's not to grab them and force them along. That's what a tutors and governors are. The teacher teaches, but if you don't retain it, all they do is teach. They don't force it upon you. The governor says this is what's going to happen. And if you don't, then he comes along and corrects it. The word of God comes along and corrects the places that you refuse to obey. So he continues on in his teaching. We see the process of progress. I believe that the lesson that Paul is trying to teach the churches in Galatia is that just because you're a child of God doesn't mean that you get to strut around as though you're superior to those around you. Matter of fact, he reminds them that they're servants with much to learn before they can serve in another level. These churches in Galatia are being rebuked by Paul because they've, they've gone away from where they were. In verse number 25 of the previous chapter, it says, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And then he, he gets finished saying that, you have put on Christ in verse 27, and then he has to go back and explain it again. You see how hard-headed they are? Aren't they like Christians? Boy, God will just make it as plain as day to us. The preacher will preach the message, and you'll think, boy, God spoke to me today. And by tomorrow morning... We're right back doing the same thing that God spoke to us about last night. But can I say this? And I, I said this a lot when I was a youth pastor, and, and even in preaching I say it often. You know, God puts you through tests in life. And you'll keep, just like in school, you'll keep taking that test until you pass it. Now, if you go ahead and, and work hard to pass it this time, you'll be past it. It doesn't mean more tests aren't coming. Matter of fact, you can mark it down that the, the next test is going to be harder, right? You'd get out of 10th grade and you think, okay, I made it through 11th grade's nothing. And then you find algebra is there waiting for you. And you're ready to quit school and go get a job in a coal mine and never, never see the light of day again. But you press on. You pass the test. But if you fail the test, you got to do summer school. And nobody likes summer school. But you got to do summer school. And then if you fail summer school, you got to take the grade back over again. But eventually, you stop being hard-headed, you pass the test, and you never have to take that test again. You move on. The Galatians are like us. <laughs> they keep taking the test and failing the test and taking the test and failing the test. And Paul reminds them, and he's going to remind them again, when you pass the test, you're done with the test. Can I tell you this evening, if you get nothing else out of this message, just pass the test. Put in a little effort and pass the test. Let, let's move on and let God show you new things in your life and teach you new things. Number two, I want you to see in verse 3 through 6, we find the point of possession. Verses 3 through 6, he begins uh, talking about those elements of the world in verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of the sons, because we are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Did you catch that at the end of verse number four? Look what it says. God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. 
Some people forget that Jesus was born on the side of the law. When he was born, the law was still in effect. Until he dies, the law is still there. He was born on that side of the law because he was going to redeem the people who were under the law. And then with his death and burial and resurrection, he comes up and now enters that that point of grace where we're now saved by faith through grace. Jesus Christ now saves us by faith in him, in him alone. He's he's born under the law. He's made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. This point of possession takes place in uh, verse 3 through 6. We see that beginning portion where there's this child who has to serve and learn some things and has some parameters. But from verses 3 through 6, some things are taking place in this person's life, in the church's life, in your life, where God is beginning to take a hold of you and and, and transform you. It's the point begins at salvation. That's the point. And from that moment of salvation, there's a sanctification that's taking place. Christ has bought you with His blood, and at that moment you were become adopted by the Father. And that's when in verse number 6 comes in, and He says that He sends the Spirit into you, crying, Abba, Father. Now you go from this... This, this person who was under the elements of the world and struggling and trying to make things happen and God begins to work in your life. You ask Jesus Christ into your heart. You get saved. God sends the Spirit in to begin transforming you to show you some things in your life and He begins to transform you. This point of possession is where God steps into your life and it begins changing you. And then you get to verse number 7 and this is where we find the third point and perhaps the most important point, as, as Paul is dealing with Galatia, the churches in Galatia, as he's dealing with Galatia, he is dealing with these people who are stubborn, who are foolish. They've seen God transform them. They've seen God do miracles in their life. They've seen the wondrous works. And then they turn back to the old ways. <laughs> they, they see, it's like when you, t- you take the, uh, I remember watching a movie on us, a boy, the Wilbur, the pig. I remember what that was called. Because I remember this pig. I remember they had to give a, a, a buttermilk bath. It washed up the pig. And then it gets to the fair and you know, it gets all back in the mud and they got to wash it again. That's what I think of when I think about a, a, a Christian going back to the world. God cleans them up, makes them spotless, show worthy. <laughs> they're, they're in perfect, perfect condition. And then just as soon as they can, they go right back. It's like my boys and get them dressed too soon before church. They will not look like they're ready for church. We see the pivot of position in verse number 7. Wherefore thou art no more a, what? Servant. Verse number 1 is a great contrast from being a child and differeth nothing from a servant, he said. You're just stepped into this. You've just become saved. You are no different than the servant. You don't understand. You just need to go along and do what you need to do and watch how things are done and learn and grow. And then you step away from being a child. A child is, we we baby it from the moment they're born. We feed them. We change their diet. But they can't do anything as they progress, as they learn. We give them a little more freedoms. But when that child doesn't want to follow freedoms, we contain them, right? Right? We buy the baby fences and put them inside there and then build them up and try to keep them from climbing over and somehow they get out. We put them in cribs that think bars. We're teaching them to go to jail at an early age and we put them in the bar. But as they learn to do what they're supposed to do and stay within the parameters, we remove those. We put those things on the doorknobs. You know what I'm talking about? Those, those little things, they can't grab it. We got them on our house now because Azariah, he would just, early in the morning, he's outside, 6 a.m., go open those doors and hit out the door. Now we put those things on that we've constrained him so he can't go on. But there comes a point, and this is that pivotal moment, verse number 7. They come to this point where they're no more a servant but a son. And he says, but, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. This is the second time we see that word heir. Before he's a heir, he's, a, he's, he's a, a become, the estate is his. But there's some things that need to take place. But in verse number 7, that moment of pivoting, there's a time when he realizes that you can no more have the milk, but the meat now is required. And now you're going to have to take on the responsibilities of being a heir of, of God. 
a joint heir with Christ. You say, what in the world are you talking about, preacher? What takes place between verse number 1 and verse number 7 is the Holy Spirit of God teaches and feeds the new convert, making them grow stronger in the knowledge of the Lord as they get further from the bondage. They're getting closer to the Lord and the liberty found in Christ alone. They've gone from restrictions to now they have full liberty. And this is where the argument comes on. There's so many Christians that want to go out into sin and live the way the world lives and think that that's what the liberty of Christ is. Oh, no, friend. The liberty of Christ is when you've come to that point of maturity as a Christian that you no longer desire the things of the world, but you hunger for the Word of God and that relationship with Christ. And it has so transformed your life that you don't get near that line that you could easily step on or cross and get into trouble. You begin, as you get closer to the Lord, you're getting further from the world. You're getting further from that line, and there's no possibility of falling over there unless you turn and intentionally walk back. That's what's taking place in verse number 7. He says, now you've become a son, but a son. And if a son, he says, then an heir of God through Christ. In other words... Now your royalty, act like it. You see in all the news and newspapers here recently over the last years, I guess probably not in the last year or two, but just I remember so much. I remember from the time that Princess Diana died in a car wreck or something years ago. It seemed like there was always something about the royal family in Britain. There was always something about that royal family. The queen is always on TV. We'd see things about the princes and the the, uh, Prince Harry and Prince Philip. And all these names were always there. And every time you saw them, they were always dressed so well. They always walked just that perfect. I walk like a a baboon sometimes, I think. But, boy, they just walk around. So they get the door. Somebody opens the door. It's royal. When you see them, you know that there's something about them. When you see somebody who's in the military, they present themselves a certain way. When you see somebody who's a police officer, a firefighter, one of those people that's just in a position, they, they carry themselves about in a certain way. They, that, that royal family example I was using a minute ago, you know that they're a part of the royal family because of how they present themselves all the time. Not sometimes, all the time. It's interesting, this just popped in my head. How about the two that left the royal family and moved to America? If you know uh, Meghan Markle and some uh, Prince Harry, I think, maybe, I don't know. I don't follow news enough to know. But I know this, they left the royal family. And now look at them. There's nothing about royal in their life. Now they're just everyday folks. Now They no longer carry themselves and present themselves. They're a good example of the Christian who goes into the world and no longer acts like Christ. They no longer have that royal appearance to them. Verse number 7 is that pivotal point. It's the moment when the Spirit of God's been put in in the verses before. It begins to lead the child from that governing time, from that tutoring time as they were sitting under the preaching and sitting under the teaching and learning the Word of God and memorizing the verses and it began to transform their life. Verse number 7 says, Now you're no longer a child. Now you're the heir of God. Now you're going to walk around and present yourself that way. Can I tell you this evening that the reason so many Christians... I'm going to have to put some quotations around that. And this country don't have the power of God in their life is because when verse 7 comes around, there's not many there. Because somewhere along from verse number 1 to verse number 6, when this process of salvation is taking place, they somewhere along there go, you know what? I don't like these parameters. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me how to live my life. Sounds like the Christians in America, doesn't it? Sounds like people we know. It sounds like us sometimes. I don't like to dress that way. I don't like to do that. I don't like to not be able to watch this. And that's what God says. Because he's trying to protect our minds from the destruction that happens down the road. Verse number 7 is that pivotal moment. It helps us see that there must be a changing to take place in our life, a point when we're no longer childlike but instead become a dignitary of the royal throne. We see the fourth point in verses 8 through 10. It's a problem of perception. 
from verses 8 through verse number 10, Howbeit then that when you know not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods, but now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Ye observe days and months and times and years. There's this problem of perception that we have. See, we want to see that we're, we're doing a good job. But God says, no, 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 no. You need to be away from that line. Yeah, but God, I'm, I'm trying. I know I'm over here, but I'm on the right side. I, I know that I'm close to looking like the world. I know that I'm close to acting like the world. I know that I've got some things in my life that kind of reflect the world because I'm so close to them, their image reflects off of me. Instead of me being so close to God, the image reflects off. That's a pretty good thought. I have to mark that one down. We get closer over here, we reflect Christ. Write that down, Brandon. I need to remember that one. The problem of perception is found in verse number 8. Did you see it? It says, ye did service. Ye did service. When you're in the world, you did service to those things that aren't even, they were gods to you, but they're not God. They're not gods. They don't even live. But you made, I thought, I thought of a, a car. You buy a car, right? You buy a nice car and, you're tired of the old old ones that you buy breaking down, so you're going to go get a new one. That's what I did. You know, you go get a n nicer car, and now it's not going to break down. But what happens when it breaks down? You just let it sit there and rot? <laughs> no, you got too much invested in it now. Now you have to get it fixed. So you go do service to it. Get it back into running condition. Make sure that it's good and working properly and back on the road. And because it's a car, let's face it, we can't live without our car. If our phone broke, we'd have a phone within days. Maybe within hours. But when our life is broke, we're okay. We're content staying out there for months, years, sometimes decades. That's what he's addressing in verse 8. He says, you did service to those gods. Watch what he says. Verse 9, but now, after you've known God, look halfway down. How turn ye again. You're the one that's doing this. It's not God. You see, the thing is, most people think that they can't get close to God because God won't let them. God won't answer my prayers. God never answers my prayers. I've tried. God doesn't do it. He won't do this for me. No. God says, ye. Ye turned again. Ye went. Look at the very end of verse number 9. Where into ye desire again the bondage. But I never desire bondage. Oh, yes, you did. Because when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Paul's dealing with the church in Galatia, and it's a representation of everyone here today. We're in this thing of either we can walk with God or walk in the world. We can represent God and have His power on us. You know what he says in verse 10? He says, "Ye observe days and months and times and years. You observe seasons. You, you, you're watching everything and making sure everything's so structured in your life, but you're not watching eternity. Everything in verse number 10 is for this world. Their focus, the reason they keep finding themselves under in, in, facing bondage again, facing themselves uh, back to those things. You see what it said in verse number uh, 9 where it said, Again, you turn, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? You know what that is? That's the alcohol. That's the bitterness. That's the nicotine. That's the drugs. The weak and beggarly elements. You know why you turn there? Because there's, there's some kind of... Uh, um, there's temporary pleasures in those things. And we turn back to them, though they're weak and beggarly. They're weak because they only last for that little short period of time. They're beggarly because they'll always beg you to come back again. You turn to those when the power, the true power that can relieve you from all those things is found in God. In verse 10 and 10, he says, you do all those things, you observe all these things, you've got it all so well structured, yet you keep falling because you're not focused upon God. And that brings us to the final point, number five, the promise of preaching. From verses 11 through verse 14, you find he starts off verse 11 saying something that almost doesn't make sense. He says, I am afraid of you, Paul who's been shipwrecked three times, who's been bit by a viper, he says he's afraid of the churches in Galatia. I think if Paul lived today, he'd be afraid of the churches of America. He says, I, I feel, I'm afraid of you. 
because you, you pretend like you're a Christian. You pretend, he even goes on, that's why I read on so you get that context. He said, I would even say that if it were possible, you'd pluck out your eyes and give them to me. That's how well you're willing, willing to play. And then it's going to go on and we'll see this next Wednesday, Lord willing, how he's going to address them. Now you're angry at me. You're mad at me because I'm giving you the truth. Paul would be afraid of the churches in America today. He says, I am afraid of you because I feel like I'm laboring in vain. I'm just constantly preaching to you and preaching that God will deliver you and that God will uh, take you away from those things that constrain you and take you away from the bondage. I'm preaching to you that God will give you power to lead people to Christ. I'm preaching to you that you can have victory in Jesus. He says, I'm afraid of you because I'm preaching that. Truth of the matter is, I'm living that. That's Paul saying. I'm living it. I'm proof of it. But for some reason, you're not proof of it. What's going on? Paul deals with it. And he sums it up. And I love how he says this in verse 12. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. You know, sometimes people look at a preacher a pastor, an evangelist. Sometimes they'll look at the deacons and they'll say, those guys, they're just, they're way up here. Well, they may appear way up here, but they're no more out of reach of where you can be. The choices that they've chosen to separate themselves from the world. That's what Paul says. He says, I wish you would just follow me. Just do what I'm doing. He says, I'm exactly like you. He goes on to say in that next verse, he says, I have temptations in the flesh just like you do. I'm facing things and you have seen them. That's what he says. Look at verse 14. In my temptation, which was in the flesh, ye despise not. Paul says, listen, you can have the victories that I'm living every day because I'm just like you. I have those temptations. Jesus was tried with those temptations. And he said, no, no, I don't want that. I'd rather have my father. And we struggle in this life because we don't trust that the power of the preaching that God's chosen. He said that. 1 Corinthians in in chapter 1 and verse 20 and 21, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolishness, a foolish the wisdom of this world? And after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now that goes for the the lost man and and hearing that preaching and getting saved. But did you know that's an application too for the saved man? To be saved from those things of falling back into bondage if he just take the word of God when it's delivered in the service and delivered in the preaching. He says, be as I am because I'm as you are. You can live a victorious life and have the power of Almighty God. That's what is being addressed in the first portion of Galatians chapter 4. I told you I couldn't preach all of it. Because really I had to to skip through some things in there that I really wanted to hunker down on, but for another time. Because Paul saying, oh foolish Galatians, you're a child of the king. I mean, let's face it, tonight if you just got word that you inherited a billion dollars. I mean, one billion dollars. But you couldn't, you couldn't come as, as you've been and how you've been living. You have to make some changes in your life. If you'll make some changes, if you're going to have to present yourself well, you might even have to go take an etiquette class. I guess I'm out. <laughs> are you saying, uh-huh, because you agree I'm out, or are you because you out? <laughs> You're gonna have to make some. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to go learn how to properly, you know, set the 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 fork and the knife and the spoon. I don't know how the order goes, but in order for that billion dollars, you're gonna have to do that. I think it'd be safe to say we'd all be like, I mean, a billion dollars. I can give up a couple months of my life and learn that stuff. I'll take the billion dollars. God says, I've got an eternity of riches that you, your mind. He says, your mind can't even begin to comprehend what he has for you in heaven. You, you can't even begin to understand. It's not even possible for man to dream up what's in heaven. He said, you're a child of the king. Start acting like it. Our God, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you, Father, for the message that's contained within that always seems to be just what we need. Lord God, if we could grab hold of that truth tonight. I pray, Lord God, that you'd help us to see in our own hearts and own lives and our own minds and in every day walk, Lord God, as we step, step after step. I ask you, Lord God, to show us the areas in our life that we need to change, to make more of the image of Christ, more of that royalty, that hair of the child of God. I pray, Lord God, you'd show us the things that we need to see and that we need to know. And I pray that you would give us the strength to do it. We know you'll do these things. We ask you to help us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and get.